right. Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to, let's say, January's webinar on skin care. The goal is to get a couple of these in every month for people. We can answer a lot of your questions you have, um, see if we can give you some good training, and then uh, report back to you a lot of things that we learn in either industry research we do or in uh, some of the trade shows we go to and also in the lab here, the things that we're working on um, as far as ingredients and uh, clinical trials and, and that kind of stuff. So today I want to talk about um, what I've found is the, the three big failures uh, even the best skincare brands make. Um, but I'm going to teach you how, when, why, and, and hopefully get you to see the, the difference in how you can present your brand, your skincare, and um, like I said, at the end, if we have time for questions, we'll go over all that. The big thing that comes down to uh, skincare is marketing, and we really want to talk about messaging. We want to talk about um, you know who our ideal client is. So that's of some of what we'll give you today, uh, and then be able to go into to more details later. The screen sharing option, because I'm on the little free go to meeting at the moment, uh, may not be the best for presentation. So hopefully you all can see everything OK. Um, and then uh, we're going to pick up the uh, go to webinar from now on. So it'll be much easier for you all on your end. So those of all that you've not met me, I'm Keith Allen West. I've been in the skincare business now for 28 years, uh, uh, almost 30 years worth of hands on skincare experience. Last time I counted, I've done over 28,000 facials. Uh, so needless to say, I don't spend the eight hours a day in a treatment room anymore, but I do spend uh, still a lot of time uh, in the research treatment room testing uh, formulations, quality control, et cetera, and of course looking at, at new products. So far I've launched over four brands that have reached the one million plus mark in sales. Uh, most recently was the Urban Fresh Cosmetics, Urban Fresh New Mexico, which we launched at about $200,000 a year and grew that to over $4.1 million in three years. Uh, I do have an honorary chemistry degree from the American Chemical Society for all the work I've done in the skincare lab, and I've had over 500 major media mentions. And that's my passion, is really teaching people marketing, PR, and how to get the word out. I've made the Inc. 500, 5,000 list two years in a row, and for those of you who have not seen my divorce show on uh, Bravo TV, you can look up a show called Untying the Knot, and you'll notice why it's just me that owns the company now instead of two of us. Uh, and if you're going to get divorced, you might as well do it on Bravo. So that's my background. I've written for every major spa magazine. I really enjoy the education part uh, as well as is trying to teach as much as we can. Uh, to people who are also in the industry. Um, and again, we're on the, the free go-to meeting today, so it's not exactly best for uh, presenting, but I'm going to try to mute everybody as, as we go through it. Some exciting news for us is we are changing. We are uh, have for long been my sacred fig, uh, which was a, a skincare company that I started back in 2006 after Hurricane Katrina. And now that we've spent so much time in the West and we're really using a lot of the ingredients that we get from the Southwest, we're going to be launching, and you all are the first to know this, uh, relaunching as Wild West Skincare. So we'll do the private label, white label, and custom formulations for people. Uh, still with the same focus on natural, organic, wild crafted, uh, but it'll all be just under a, a new brand uh, with new exciting products coming as well. So part of what we like to focus on and uh, every brand out there should focus on is, you know, what is what are, what is it you do? What are you known for? So when we sat down and talked, we, we came up with four major things that we thought were important for us, um, which are also things that you should come up with in your mission statement or identifying what it is you, you want to be known for. So for us, we want to be a, a global citizen, which means our fair trade practices, artisan made, which is why we work with a lot of small suppliers that are wild crafting, natural or organic. We want to have a small footprint and a big impact. So if you've not read recently any of the, the blog posts, we are 100% solar run company now. We actually sell back our extra solar to the power company here. We collect all of our rainwater off the uh, roof when we do get our rain, so we can use that for irrigation systems. 
and uh, we want to be all natural. So we try to produce everything we can without chemicals uh, to the best extent possible. And homegrown, we're made in the U.S. Uh, majority of our suppliers are from here in the U.S. as well. So we, we've really been trying to focus on the professional quality products, uh, which you can then put your brand name on, as well as some of the semi-custom work, which means we take the products we already make, and then we may tweak or change those uh, for your specific brand. And also full custom work, which means you start from scratch with us, and, and we kind of walk through that whole process. So that's the future uh, of where we're going and, and you know, what we're trying to do. Um, so let's talk about the industry in general uh, and the fact that you know, I've now done this since uh, 2006 was when I really started manufacturing products for other people. Let's go back a little further than that. I actually started my career uh, in the skincare world my senior year of high school. My uh, skin used to be so bad, I wouldn't date, I wouldn't be social, I wouldn't go out. I did everything possible wrong to it and decided it was finally time to go to school and figure out how to do um, skin care correctly. So I uh, lied to everybody and, and snuck away my senior year in high school to go to night classes to become an esthetician. Then spent four years getting a journalism marketing degree, uh, fell in love with New Orleans, bought a hotel in the French Quarter, added a day spa to that after 9-11, uh, and the, the manufacturing of skincare started with the hotel. So since we were a small Victorian-themed hotel, we started making our own soaps and lotions because we figured if you were going to check into something that was frilly and full of doilies and cherubs, you probably didn't want dial soap uh, in your bathroom. So that's when we started doing soaps and shampoos and conditioners. Once we added the uh, day spa after 9-11, that's when we started doing more as far as our own skincare formulations, body care formulations. And then as if two businesses were, were not enough, I decided to open a, a coffee house in New Orleans, which was voodoo themed because I spent eight years studying with a voodoo priestess on, you know, cleanse, bless, heal, herbs, uh, uh, healing rituals, those kind of things. So we actually launched our own brand at the coffee shop as well which were uh, voodoo themed bath salts. So blessings for money, health, wellness, love, all those good things. So that's kind of been the, the trek of getting me where I am. And in that, in that time frame in the industry, we've seen a lot of growth. So we have seen um, a lot of the, the sales increases, the revenue increases, but even during the big downturn, which would have been the 2008 years when we were in Santa Fe, uh, you know, we had the, the market crash, we had the home market crash, the sales in the skincare world did not take near as big of a dip because people were still spending money to make themselves look and feel good. So as expected, skincare is not slowing down. The global skincare industry is estimated to reach $121 billion. Uh, that was by last year. Uh, and by uh, 2018, we expected the U.S. market will be $11 billion. And that's the big thing you have to remember. When I'm talking to people who are creating new brands, the U.S. market is less than 5% of the global market, uh, especially in skincare. So now I'm working with people who are really trying to create the international brands. We just got back from the Indie Beauty Expo, which was in L.A. We were excited because out of the you know couple hundred people that were exhibiting, we were actually the manufacturer for two of those clients, one of which is uh, already launched a brand in her brand was launched in Singapore, Australia, Portugal. She's going to be in Sephora in the U.S., Europe, and I can't even remember all the other parts of the world. But she started her brand specifically uh, to be a global brand, knowing that she wanted to be able to reach that larger part, which is the $121 billion, versus just the part in the U.S., which was, would be the uh, nearly $11 billion. So let's also talk about where where people are spending money or what people are spending money on because we want to get a really clear idea of uh, where they're spending their money, what products they're spending their money on, and then also we can use that information to kind of tailor how we market our brands or what our message is. So I just pulled off a list of the leading anti-aging facial brands in the United States for last year. So these are your millions of dollars. So uh, if you look at the list, nobody should be surprised that number one, two, three, all are Oil of Olay, which is owned by Procter & Gamble. 
Uh, they are one of the biggest players in the retail market. Um, but they really have done a good job of getting their messaging right. Um, and it's not something they were good at in the past. Uh, but they have been working with people like me over the years to test advertising, test messages, and figure out what really drives those sales. Um, the thing I thought was quite interesting, though, is, is number four at uh, 68.4 million, which isn't bad compared to the number one selling product in the U.S., uh, being the Olay Regenerist at 88.7 million. But private label has moved that far up the list. So within just probably the last uh, five or ten years, uh, private label products went from being kind of a, a lower quality or lower priced option in the market to actually competing with the big dollar big brands on retail shelves, not just on uh, shelves in spas and salons. So that's been another pretty big shift that we've seen in the industry is in the old days, the majority of, of my clients that were, were coming to the lab for skincare were spas and salons um, looking to really uh, be able to compete with the, the big brands like an Aveda or an Eminence who were you know, selling new products, but then at the same time out there competing uh, to get sales directly on their website. Now when we look at uh, who's coming to us to make products, it's the, the same spas and salons, but we're getting people now that are just entrepreneurs. They have no skincare experience whatsoever, but they are the ones now that, that are, are either launching their second career or investing some money, and they are, are launching a brand uh, that is not tied to a salon or a spa, but it is just uh, either an Amazon brand, because we have clients on Amazon right now selling you know, one to, to 5,000 units of a product a month, um, or they're, just, they're creating a brand for you know, a retail store or a niche-specific store, uh, like a mom, mom and baby store that they have online. And then if you keep going down your list, you see you've got L'Oreal, Neutrogena, some more Oil Volet, Rock uh, Retinol Correction, Deep Wrinkle. That's another one that has moved up the list quite a bit as they've gotten their messaging more correct uh, on what the product does. And then, of course, L'Oreal and, again, Neutrogena. So that gives you kind of the overview of you know, who the, the consumers out there are, are giving their money to. And what you're not going to get on this list are going to be the, you know, the more boutique like a Chanel or Dior uh, skincare makeup lines just because they don't compete with the volume um, as, a, as the mass market retailers do. Um, and that's the easiest way to, to see what the trends are as you look at the mass market retailers to see where people are spending the money uh, because then you can, you can follow the money. So the next exciting thing is that it's really the, the multifunctional products that are now in high demand. Um, we've been dealing with these in, this, in the skincare industry for quite a while, um, but it, it's now at a point where we as a manufacturer are looking at, at options to create these kind of products for you, the brand, um, that, that will be uh, good for you to sell as far as um, uh, products that the, the consumers are now looking for. So your BB cream, your, so your, your blemish balm or beauty balm, your CC cream, which is all your color correcting, uh, are, have, con have continued to grow in popularity over the past few years. So when you look at uh, U.S. department stores, uh, selling just those products is close to nine million. And I think this comes down to two things. Uh, one, we want people are wanting a product that does multiple things. Uh, to make life easy in, in a hectic world. And also, uh, people are having more issues as we've gotten older, dealing with our, our sun damage or um, issues that, that we've created for ourselves when we were younger and uh, should have known better, uh, but didn't. So any of the products that you have that deal with, uh, anti-aging is going to be a largest category. Anti-aging is going to include your color correcting or uh, dark spot removal, whatever you want to call that, that whole industry of, of sunspots or sun damage, uh, as well as you know, lines and wrinkles. So that's going to give you an idea of growth. Let's talk about, even today, I spent probably a good four hours just online looking at, at different brands that have either launched recently, like the ones we saw at the Indie Beauty Expo, 
uh, which was the one in LA. They have one coming up in Dallas and one coming up in New York. Uh, those are, are actually an interesting show because they're completely different from the, the big spa shows that most of us are used to going to. So this one was specific to launching brands. Um, so uh, brands for consumer on one day and then brand, launching your brand to professional markets on the second day. Uh, but I, I spent a lot of time today really trying to get an idea of who's doing things right and who's, who's kind of missed the mark. And most important to me then is to talk about the three big failures um, and then give you some homework because I want you to be able to sit down and actually go over your brand, your marketing, uh, how you talk about what you sell, and uh, come up with a really good way to emotionally connect with your clients, um, either in person if you own a store or online if you're a retailer. So number three uh, mistake is the majority of the brands out there are too focused on new. New ingredients, um, you know, what's hot, what's new, what's now. And those of us that are in the industry have been dealing with some of the, the tried and true things like vitamin C or peptides or soy extract or things for so long that they really no longer excite us or appeal to us. But we have to remember that uh, in the industry, because we work in skincare and a lot of us that work in uh, salons or spas have been exposed to these uh, ingredients way before the mass market. So I always laugh because the, the skincare world is a lot like the fashion world. So your East Coast and your West Coast gets all the fashion first, and then it takes a good five, ten years for that fashion to trickle down to you know the middle of America, or even trickle down to where the majority of America uh, can afford to to buy the trend or be trendy. And we do have places in in the fashion world like H and M or Zara that are changing that. They're getting uh, fashion out to people much faster, but nobody's doing that in the skincare world. So people have access to skincare more now through a Sephora or an Ulta, but they're not adopting. Uh, we don't have as many early adopters in the skincare world uh, for what we're selling. So, for example, when you look at that list of the top sellers, uh, you got Oil, a, Oil of Olay Regenerist, uh, several of their Oil of Olay products. There are no new exciting ingredients in those products. Uh, the majority of what the world is looking for in uh, skincare now, ingredient-wise, is still peptides, peptides, peptides. Um, it's just now getting uh, enough saturation. When you look at the beauty magazines, when you look at the beauty blogs, when you look at the TV advertising, um, we as is a, a manufacturer and you as a brand can spend a lot of our time trying to be cutting edge, being new and exciting, being you know the next great ingredient, the first use of the coffee bean extract, or the first use of you know the argon oil a few years ago. That was the, the hot hip new, let's get it out there. But we can often waste our time and waste our money trying to get too far ahead of the market we're serving. And another example that, that's really good to look at for, for that is, uh, like I said, I've been in the skincare industry for almost 30 years. And iSPA, which is the International Spa Association, released a report a couple years ago that and they, they interview about 8,000 spa goers a year for this amazing you know, 300 page document on uh, all, all kinds of things that, that spa goers, and these are, are pretty highfalutin um, clients, but you know, what do they do, what do they want? And a few years ago was the first time ever that over half of the people who responded said they were finally ready to try microdermabrasion or try a hot stone massage. And those of us that have worked in the industry, or even if you're not in the industry, you're a spa goer, uh, microdermabrasion has been around for what seems like a billion years. Hot stone massage sure seemed like it was very popular in the 80s, um, and just every spa in the world added that to their menu. But we still have only half 
of people who are regular spa goers, which would be the you know the, the more educated, more aware group of people out there, saying that they're ready to try either of those services. So we can we can spend a lot of time researching and trying to make sure we have the hottest, greatest, best ingredients and the newest things out there, but still be so far ahead that there's not a market for it. Um, so by focusing on you know, where the consumer education level is, and then making sure that we, la we are, are launching those products in your brands so that you have the products that have the peptides, you have the products that have the vitamin Cs. Um, you know, SkinCeuticals, which was the, the big 20% vitamin C company that did all the research and, and spent millions and millions of dollars researching vitamin C to figure out that 20% was the ideal amount and, and what else you could do antioxidant-wise to um, boost the benefit of that. You know, they launched that product, what now, maybe about 10 years ago, and we're just now seeing in the, the consumer market um, that, that push towards vitamin C. So I want you all to, to kind of take some time to, to stop and think about, you know, which products you're either already selling in your line um, or you want to add to your line or if you're creating a line, look, spend some time looking at, you know, what is on TV now. Look at the Rock Retinol commercials. Look at uh, the Oil of Olay, the peptide commercials. Um, look at, uh, I believe it's Neutrogena, which is really working in the, you know, the dark spot removal. Um, and see that those are the, the issues that, that are most important to people and the products that it's going to be easier for you to sell. So one of the, the, uh, the examples that I always like to use in the spa world. So I opened up my uh, first spa in New Orleans in 2001. I expected it to be an amenity to my hotel. Um, but the damn thing took off. So by the time I had sold the hotel after Hurricane Katrina, we actually didn't have any guest rooms left. We had converted all six guest rooms over to spa rooms because did you want 175 an hour or 175 a night? You do the math, you'll take the, the hourly rate anytime. So we had converted everything over. Um, and, and the way we grew that spa so quickly was we did not advertise toward people who didn't know what a facial was. We found people who were who loved getting facials but probably didn't like where they were going. So most of the people we found were people that were already spa goers at one of the top spas but weren't happy because I did not have to convince those people why they should get a facial. I just had to convince them why they should try a facial with us to see why we were better. So in the world of selling products, now that people are hearing about peptides, learning about peptides, you know, learning about the other ingredients that are uh, anti-aging, anti-wrinkle, find the people who have heard of those and you convince them to try your product versus trying to convince them why they need a whole new brand new product that they've not heard of. You know, the only product that I sell that I spend a lot of time convincing people why they need it is a toner because 99% of the world has no freaking idea why they need a toner. So that one is one where we have to convince people. But even in our messaging, so we've talked about ingredients, but in our messaging, um, a lot of us try to do the new, exciting, fun uh, product or whatnot. New is not always a reason for somebody to make a purchase. Um, so coming up with you know a new product will not automatically increase the sales of all your other products. Um, and also then focusing on, on usage. So we want to we want to do a much better job of explaining to people how to use products and what benefits they're going to get from those. So that's the big thing. We're too focused on new. So if we stop and look back, um, the other reason I could grow uh, Urban Fresh so quickly was um, instead of convincing people that they wanted a fun, organic, natural product, all I had to do was tell them that I was the organic, natural, local version of Lush. So people who already go to Lush, you know, bath bombs and all those little places that are in the mall everywhere, um, it was easier for me to launch a company that was a better version of one already out there 
and do it, uh, do a better job of it, uh, a more fun, exciting local job of that, than to come up with a brand new idea and launch it. Because once I knew that I was going after Lush and after the people that like going to Lush, it's very easy to find those people or tell people what you have. You know, hey, we're the local version of Lush. If they know what Lush is, they're automatically going to know what it is we sell and what it is we do. So we don't have to worry about being the newest, bestest, greatest. In our mind, we just need to be able to provide that uh, for the person who's actually looking to spend the money, uh, which is going to be the consumer. Number two is no clear brand story. I see this all the time when you know you got pretty packaging and you got a pretty label and gosh, your logo's awful nice and there's no story behind the brand. So nobody really knows why you made it, what it does. Um, the majority of what we, we market is not the physical product. You know, nobody ever wandered into my store or my spa and said, oh my God, you have facial cleansers. I've been looking for those my whole life, right? They're out there at plenty of other locations. What people are trying to find is, why is your facial cleanser the one I've been looking for my whole life? And, you know, why, why do I need that even if I didn't know that I need that? And, oh my God, I identify with that, so I have to have it. So the story is, is what really matters in branding and marketing. So you've got some out there, uh, you know, Kiehl's is a really good example. While I don't like hardly any of their products, if you go to the Kiehl's website, which is one of the pieces of homework that I'll give you, you know, go to the Kiehl's website and look at, uh, you know, the About Us or the History page or whatnot. It's actually done very well. Um, you know, it's, it starts out 165 years ago in New York's East Village. We began an old world apothecary. So just those few sentences has already set the tone in my mind. And of course, they have the pictures from back then, or at least black and white versions of pictures to make it look like it's back then. Uh, but then they go through the whole thing, and you know, they kind of break down um, you know, the, the different years, and when you know, the Keels family used to really own it, and what happened when, and when they brought on. And, and they've done a great job of taking a history. Now, theirs is a much longer history than companies I've owned, or probably companies that most of you own. But it doesn't have to be, you know, a 200-year history or 165-year history in their case to be interesting. What's interesting is the why. And the why you've launched a brand or why you've created a brand is what matters most to people. Um, so an example that I, I put on the screen was when we launched our spa in New Orleans. We uh, did a little history research. We found who owned the building way back when. Um, so back in 1883, Miss Celie Bruin, a lively Creole woman, pampered New Orleans' socialites in her Maison de Beauté. The salon was located in the parlor of the rooming house owned by Mademoiselle Lizzie Anier Francais. Lizzie was the eccentric widow of an indigo, bar indigo baron, spent most of her life traveling. It was during these journeys that Miss Celie, her nursemaid, uh, with Miss Celie, her nursemaid, that they discovered the European spas. Returning to New Orleans, they recreated those opulent surroundings in the home she was given by Lucien Maison, a free man of color. A luxurious way to relax and refresh one's appearance, she attracted many of the prominent Storyville madams. For those of you that don't know, Storyville was their red light district. Uh, the building was bequeathed to Miss Seeley in 1890 uh, by Lizzie upon her death, and then boom, we relaunched it. So we based all that off the history of the building, and boy, we added some historic color around the characters that were there. Um, but that's, that created a story and a reason for launching a spa. Because if I had launched Pete's Spa and said, oh, well, we opened it after 9-11 because, like, tourism went down. And, yeah, we thought, you know, maybe we could, like, have some amenities. It really would not have had the same panache um, of even doing just the history and, and figuring out you know, the, the why. A, a, a lot of the, the products that have started maybe 30 years ago all started with that same myth. So there's a, you know, a common myth um, in the world of like Bobby Brown and uh, a few other ones, which is they all started making it in their kitchen. You know, none of that is true. None of these women actually started their brands in their kitchen. 
But at the time, it was a really good story because there weren't a lot of places you could go like a, a My Sacred Fig or now a Wild West Skincare that could make products for you in a reasonable way. So they needed a story and they started their story with, you know, in 1974, Mama created this really amazing hair crack in her kitchen and now you can't imagine having curly hair without it, right? But there's still a story behind it and that's part of what uh, your homework should be. If you can't tell a fun and exciting story around your brand, you're not going to hold people's interest. You're not going to get media attention. And it's not, I'm not saying you can't have a successful brand. You're just not going to be able to grow the brand as easily as if you had a story behind it. And if you're not good at writing, find someone who is, right? If you're um, not even sure what would make a good story, Find someone who can ask the right questions to get that out of you. The other one on your screen is the newest company that uh, I just acquired back in uh, June. It's called Clearlight the Cedar Company. And Clearlight um, is a company that had an amazing story, and I just get to continue it. So it, it was actually launched the year I was born. So I can now say that, you know, I've been making skincare since 1971. Okay, I haven't, but the company I own has. Um, so what happened was Josh Pine, who was an actor at the time, did a lot of work in uh, Hollywood Westerns, got tired of auditioning and not getting jobs and hopped on his motorcycle and, you know, took off for a ride and ended up in Placidas, New Mexico, which is just a half hour north of Albuquerque. And he fell in love with it and decided he was giving up his acting career and he had met some Hopi Indians and found out about the usages or the usage usage of uh, New Mexico cedar needles, and the smell was amazing, and he loved it. So he gave up his Hollywood career. He opened a little store in Placidas, New Mexico, which is way off the beaten path, um, and was lucky enough to get some good media mentions. Uh, he passed away about ten years ago. His sister, who's in her late 80s, her name is Penny, she's been running it from Chicago um, for those 10 years, and she just got tired. So she has a company that was doing a, a quarter million a year in sales, but because they had a building and all these employees and all these expenses, they were spending a quarter million a year in upkeep. So she closed it in March. And uh, typical New Mexico, which is everybody knows everybody, the accountant that used to work for them ended up being the accountant that I hired for my manufacturing company. And he said, you know, that Clearlight company went out of business. I could probably get you, you know, ownership of it if you want. And knowing that it's, uh, their incense is, is world famous. It's burned in the, the Hyatt Regency Tamaya here. Um, their clients are very upscale. Like, I think we've shipped products uh, since we bought it to every single penthouse all around. Uh, Central Park, uh, we of course said yes, we would buy it. So now we can say that we've taken this amazing company, uh, which also ties into my background because I used a lot of cedar in my studies with the voodoo priestess. I studied for eight years with a Native American shaman. I studied for eight years with an Ayurvedic healer, and I now have a company all based around cedar. But the story now gets to be that we saved the company um, we still acknowledge the history because Josh is the one that made it. And now we've taken that company and we have taken their 45 year old formulations and we've made them organic and natural and wild crafted. So that is one that we are still crafting the story on because we just took it over. So we're taking Josh's story and then turning that into what we are going to make it. Um, and, and part of that of course is making it a green business and making it organic and natural and wildcrafted. And then also realizing that, you know, not only is the cedar part spectacular, but the cedar brand, the lifestyle that goes along with New Mexico, which everybody loves, thanks to, to Breaking Bad, if you've, if you've seen that show, you know, everybody is fascinated with Albuquerque, but even before that show was possible, uh, the Southwest has always been a huge draw for people, and especially Europeans. They love this part of the world. Um, so we've got you know, Santa Fe, which is a, a huge destination for people. So it just turned into the, the perfect brand that we could add to what we were already doing, and it had the story. 
So you've got to be able to have a story. The other thing that, that's great too is, and it should tie into it, so, you know, clear light for Josh was his idea of happiness and home and hearth and good karma and whatnot. So that's why that, that he named it clear light, uh, the cedar company. Uh, Miss Seeley's, who was one of the women that owned the building, was the reason that we named the spa that. So the name you pick should also have a really good story, right? If it's just sanctuary or, you know, one of those overused spa words, but it doesn't mean anything to you, your family, why you created it or your story, or we can't be creative and craft something around it, it's going to be a harder brand to sell. It's going to be a harder brand for people to remember because most people will remember the story. Now, that is a problem we have at the moment with Clear Light. So if you look at that logo where it says Clear Light, the Cedar Company, nobody knows the name of the company is Clear Light. The front of their bottles all said Cedar Mountain Lotion or Cedar Mountain whatever, and they had their, their, their company name on the back of the bottle. So most people know the company as only that little piece of cedar needle there in the middle, because that was on the front of the bottle, and Cedar Mountain Body Wash or Cedar Mountain Lotion. So we are, we are, are putting that on the front of the bottle again and trying to really tie that back into the Cedar Mountain. And the fact that the name of the company is Clear Light and why it's named that, uh, again, to bring that story to the forefront. So you've got to think of that. There's another one out there I want you all to look up, and uh, the name of the hair care line is Davines. Uh, their skincare line is called Comfort Zone, uh, but the, the hair care line, which is an Italian uh, color, it's, so it's for professional salons, it's called Davines. But Davines is actually a combination of the founder's son and daughter's names. And I can't remember the exact story of how those two names were put together to create Davines, but that's a story that people remember. So when, we're, when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with people around coming up with a brand name, we try to come up with, number one, a word that's not been overused so it can't be trademarked or protected. And the easiest way to come up with a good story is not to make one up from scratch. It's to take the real everyday stuff in your life turn that into your brand name. So if it's your pet name mixed with your daughter's name, if it's your Nana's name because she's the one that taught you about shea butter for hair or whatever, come up with a personal story that people will identify with and it's much, much, much easier to market. All right, so that's going to be really important, especially when you're, you've only got probably 10 or 20 seconds when you are either on the phone with a potential journalist or you meet a potential journalist at a, a show like we did at the Indie Expo. Um, you know, luckily one of my one of my really good friends now writes for Day Spa magazine and Skin Inc. and a lot of the industry magazines. And you know, uh, Nick, who's my vice president of, of marketing and sales, and I, we got to go to dinner with her at this cute little kind of sort of a speakeasy, and actually spend you know an hour chit chatting and getting caught up, and also you know, talking to her about what other people are pitching and what are the things that are catching her attention because it just reinforces what we know, which is you got to give them something quick in like 10 seconds, that elevator speech thing, that's going to get a journalist's attention. So if they're writing about a specific kind of skincare, why is yours going to stand out? And that's the story. Um, and we'll do probably a whole nother hour workshop just on stories and crafting stories um, in the next couple months, because um, I want to give you all some more concrete examples of uh, other ones that are, are newer and exciting brands, but have come up with those same kind of things. So that's number two. So let's recap. Number three, working our way to number one, two focused on new. Don't worry about new, worry about what people are already buying. Okay? There's only a, a small percentage of the population that is, well, like me, I'm an early adopter. I'm the one that has to have the new iPhone the day it comes out. I'm the one that wants the new Range Rover the day it comes out, right? Because I'm an early adopter. But the majority of the consumers, and especially in the skincare world, are not. They're looking for, you know, what they've heard of recently or, or what they've read recently. Number two is that they have no clear brand story. So start asking yourself questions. You know, what is your brand? What does your brand stand for? 
Um, how do you explain your brand to someone in two sentences? Uh, those kind of things. And without the drum roll, we're going to go right to number one, which is the uh, number one uh, big failure uh, that even the best skincare brands make is going to be the wrong product message. Now, this comes from a couple of problems, uh, especially those of us in the skincare business who have had any kind of technical training, um, who refer to skin by technical names of layers, or refer to things like decollete or sebum or whatever. We are far too technical. So when you look at some of the you know medical inspired ones, even on TV, this is one where Rock Retinol has done a really good job recently in changing their message. So if you go back and look at uh, uh, Rock Retinol's website or see if you can find you know, their commercials, pay attention to them when they come on TV, they went from being way technical about retinol and whatnot to explaining more about what it does and when it does it. So we spend a lot of time in our in, in the skincare world thinking if we're technical and we have numbers and we have data and we have all these things that you know it's going to make us it easier to sell. It doesn't. The consumers don't connect with those kind of things. Now I know some of you who I see names on the screen are the uh, uh, introverted, numbers driven, I want to know what every ingredient is and where it came from and why it does it and what's the molecular structure and uh, whatever. There are those people out there, but they are not by far the majority of the people spending money. So we've got to get away from being so technical and talk more about what it does. So one of the things that I do when I teach uh, hands-on product knowledge or I teach people about products and how to sell them is I don't go through every ingredient and what it does and why it's in there. Right? You should be able to have access to that at your store and your online site. If you click ingredients, yes, it drops down. And, you know, uh, Susie Anal Retentive can read every one and then research them all. But the majority of the people are not going to go through every ingredient. So there are three things that I tell someone when I'm trying to sell a product. All right? Three. Easy. Front desk, retail staff, whoever's selling, they only need to know three things about a product. One, the number one reason people buy things is smell. So if your product smells amazing, let's say it smells like kiwi or fresh strawberry, but you don't have that in the name or on the front, so people get that idea, or it's not a store where they can pick it up and smell it and get that idea, you've missed out the number one reason people buy. So three things I tell people. What's it smell like? What's it going to do for them? Okay, it's going to get rid of your dark circles. It's going to get rid of your sunspots. It's going to get rid of your acne. It's going to whatever. So what's the reason? And then the last thing is when do you use it? That's what 99% of consumers want to know about a product. So great example. It used to be called our even tone uh, moisturizer. We're cha we changed the name to the Kiwi Brightening Moisturizer. Um, smells like citrus and kiwi. Gets rid of, and, and here's another thing. I don't ever use the word hyperpigmentation with a client. Far too technical. I use, if they're older, meaning over 50, I'll use the term liver spots. Because that generation, dark spots were liver spots, and that, when you say to somebody, liver spots, there is a connotation to it around the fact that they're older and they have the spots. Or younger people, I'll use sunspots. Age spots is another one. But hyperpigmentation, because it's a medical term, doesn't have the emotional gut feeling when you tell, when you tell people about it that it's something that they want to get rid of, right? So using that sunspot, age spot, liver spot uh, gets more of that, oh, ooh, yeah, that sounds bad. I don't want that. So that's what it does. It evens out your skin tone. 
It doesn't bleach the skin. So the actual, the kiwi root extract and a few other things in there um, take the, the brown spots, which is a concentration of uh, pigment in your skin or, you know, color in your skin, and it literally breaks that pigment up to redistribute it. In healthy skin, um, one out of 32 cells has that extra pigment in it. In skin with age spots, uh, those cells clump together and we get a much bigger dark spot than we would get even uh, tone on the skin. I want you to use it morning and evening. You know, and, and people, some people will ask me, well, why does it matter if I'm using it at night? I don't care what I look like while I'm sleeping. But when you're sleeping is when the body is regenerating itself. It's going to take the kiwi root and it's going to work um, even harder while you're sleeping to improve the skin. That's it. Three things, quick, easy. All your marketing should be written that way. So when you describe a product, it's what does it smell like? What does it do for you? When do you use it? Then you can have backup material behind it. But that's what you want to get out there. Now the other wrong focus is, and I learned this in, in uh, aesthetic school as well, right? Um, everything that they teach us in professional skincare is all from my standpoint as the professional. And the consumer actually gets left out of that process. So at the beginning of a facial, it's our job normally as an esthetician, or you know, if you're a makeup artist or whatever, you're doing a skin analysis. So I you know, put the bright light on your skin with a magnifying glass, and then I tell you every single thing wrong that I see. There's sun damage, you're dehydrated, you're this, you're that. And then I do a facial, and at the end, I look at what I told you was wrong, and I sell you products. The person who paid for the facial was left out of that entire process, right? They never told me what their issues were and what they wanted fixed. I stopped doing skin analysis on people about 23 years ago. And I started just asking them the right questions. And if there's somebody either you're talking to about your product or they're standing in front of your shelves or, you know, they look like they're, they're concerned but they don't know what to pick up, you ask them this simple question. If there were two things you wanted better about your skin, what's number one? And they're going to tell you what their biggest issue is. Great. Then you would use the Kiwi Brightening Moisturizer for that. What's your second biggest issue? Lines around the eyes. Perfect. You would use the eye cream for that. Ask those questions of everybody you interact with around your skincare brand. I do the same thing with journalists, right? I'd love to tell you about my amazing Clear Light Cedar products. We are actually just launching an entire uh, line of facial products that also include the cedar, because cedar is really good for the skin. It's antibacterial, it's antimicrobial, it's toning, it's tightening. But as far as that goes, if there were two things about your skin you wanted better, I bet I've got something in the cedar world that would help. What's your biggest issue? Because you've immediately turned that focus around from you and what you're selling to them and what they're needing. And even our marketing copy is not written from a standpoint of what they need. It's written from a standpoint of what we're going to do for you, whether you want it or not. So when you look at the client psychology, so we don't take into account what's driving the client. So as, as much as we like to think that we are really important in the skincare industry and people can't live without us, people are not dying from the issues that they're buying our products for. I have never heard anybody say, oh, poor Mrs. Brown. Oh, the fine line finally got her. Oh, the poor dear. Oh, and Peggy. Oh, yeah, the Peggy, the, you know, the sun damage. Not cancer now, just sun damage. Finally got her. Yep. Oh, and, and Paul, those dark circles, took, took his life, right? So nobody's coming to us with these huge medical concerns. They're coming to us with the same concerns I had, which got me to go to aesthetic school. We are dealing with self-esteem, the sense of positiveness they have about themselves, a sense of calm, Hopefulness is a big reason that they spend a lot of money on skincare. They're hopeful that we're going to fix whatever they have an issue with that causes their self-esteem problem. Self-respect, 
love, their personal potential. Like I said, you know, I did not date. I did not, I was not social. You know, I'm sure I was clinically depressed because of my acne and whatnot at the time. So I had very limited personal potential or clarity or energy or inspiration or friendship or acceptance, right? No one of my friends told me, you have horrible skin, go home, we don't want to spend time with you. My personal feeling was I would not be accepted because of those skin issues. That is what you should market to. That is what we help people with. That is what drives sales. That is what gets repeat customers. That is what makes you sell your product above any other product out there. Because you have to write it from that standpoint of you understand the psychology of the person who would pick it up and buy it. And that alone is another topic that I'm sure we'll get into um, on around marketing one of these months, is just getting to really understand client psychology. Once we understand the concerns and issues that the buyer has, and how we market to that, we no longer are selling a product. We are providing a solution every single time they need it. Because once we've solved their problem, they're going to keep coming back to us for that problem, right? So the sunspots don't just go away and they never need us again. Or the you know dark circles under the eyes don't just go away and they never need it again. So they're going to keep coming back to us for those issues. And then as they get newer ones, then who are they going to look to? Are they going to go out and find a whole different brand of products to try? No. That is how you grow your sales, is by being able to widen your sales, which means we get more people. We get the message right, so instead of 10 people buying our eye cream, we now have 300 people who love our eye cream. But then we also deepen our sales by taking the 300 people who love our eye cream who now want our moisturizer. All right? And that's why the messaging has to be right. And that's where the majority of the brands out there are either too concerned about tooting their own horn around new, great, this, that. And again, if you read the majority of the marketing stuff, it's only about the company. It's not about what that company is, meaning their birth and their story. It's not about what that company does for others. It's not about solving problems. It's always why we're the greatest because it's marketing and that's what we think we should do. So that's the big thing is we, 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 want, we want to focus on what's the driving factors, the emotional driving factors that are going to make somebody purchase a product. And from there, we can then craft that for not only the overall brand, but for every specific um every specific product so that each of your, your products are marketed correctly. And you have to remember that what we've done as a, a private label manufacturer is create for you generic-ish descriptions of products to cover ingredients and what they do, but they're by no means perfect for an entire brand. Because a brand should have a story behind it, which means a product description should tie into your story, which means you're writing or rewriting or editing things to make it your own. And that's another reason that we allow that. So when you, you pay your fees up front to create products with us, you can customize the name of the product. You can customize the description of the product. If you pay enough money to get custom formulations or semi-custom, then, of course, we're changing what goes in the product. So, for example, if your family owns a coffee plantation in Panama and you want to launch an entire coffee caffeine line, that can be done, but it needs to be written as a way that it supports whatever that brand is. So those are the three big things that I really want you to think about and really look at, you know, what, what are the parts that you feel you need help with? What are the parts that you should do now? What are the parts that you're really happy and you want to congratulate yourself on that, hey, I feel really good about my story. I feel really good about how I talk about my product. I feel really good about asking people questions about their skincare concerns. So I can, number one, learn about their concerns, and number two, sell to their concerns, all right? So what's next? Let's talk about really getting um, into, and you're going to see all this as well as, as when we launch the rest of Wild West Skincare, because uh, the website will be relaunched here in a few weeks. 
Um, we're going to be working on all the same things, right, behind the story, which is another reason it's changing from My Sacred Fig, which was a story of, you know, Andre and I, to Wild West, which is also now a story of, of what I've done and, and where we're going. So what, I, what I'm doing for people is um, I've got a few slots that have opened up in, in my coaching stuff. And I want to take what knowledge I have um, with probably five more people and really talk about growing your brand uh, the way I do. So the other brands I've grown to be multi-million dollar brands, uh, for those of you that, that watch Breaking Bad that we talked about earlier, uh, I was lucky enough to launch a skincare line called Bathing Bad. Uh, so Breaking Bad is known for their blue meth. I make blue spa meth, which is basically blue bath salts uh, scented really nicely with some natural organic blue dye, and it's called Bathing Bad. Um, but I'm really good at crafting all the stories, all the descriptions, all, and creating a, a plan for growing that brand to that point. Um, so the coaching is going to provide you and your team, depending upon how many people you work with, uh, with direct access to me for, for proven methods for business growth, leadership, profitability, uh, vital for achieving success. Because, you know, every day we're taking probably 100 calls from people who are wanting to start new skincare lines. So it's, it's getting to be a much more competitive market now, uh, even just with people launching. So my goal is to educate you for the management, marketing, sales skills, motivate you, uh, you know, through the startup or if you're already, uh, already up in operations, you know, getting you out of the rut of those routine operations. Uh, you get to team with me and, and the, the other people here that are brand experts. Uh, your decision makers can avoid unnecessary risks. You can test new ideas with us instead of rolling it out to a market evaluate existing company procedures and policies, and then also use that to increase the, the probability of, of, of positive results. Um, trust me, I have made every mistake you can make in skincare, branding, marketing, and business, probably more than once. And if I can keep you from making those same mistakes or even coming up with new creative mistakes, then you know I'm happy to do that. So my plan's simple. We schedule four hours of business improvement coaching each month. I like to spend one hour a week. Um, or with some clients, I like to spend two hours the first week um, and then give you a break so you can get some work done and then do an hour the third and the fourth weeks. Uh, depending upon where you are in the process, I'll design how that should work. We do uh, specific business goals. We create action plans for achievement of those objectives. We track your results. We work to improve critical profit margin and also getting you the right marketing tools. So my goal, which I've now proven four times, is to get people to that multi-million dollar mark in skincare sales or in branding sales um, and do it in a way that keeps you from having to worry about all the mistakes that I made. So the way I do that is uh, normally $1,295 a month. And because of the, the new launch of the website, because of the fact that I have the five openings, we're going to do it for the $9.95 a month. Um, it uh, will be in a, a link I send you all with the recording of this, so you can actually look at what the full program entails. Uh, but it will be, uh, it's actually already on the website. Uh, if you go to mysacredfig.com slash branding support, or you want to be wild and crazy and new, use the new one, which is wildwestskincare.com slash branding support, uh, you can get an idea of the package that's on there. And I know we're right at that end of the hour, but I want to see uh, in the chat box, if those of you that can get to it, um, if there are other questions, um, let me know. And I'll give you just a couple minutes to see. Let me go back in here and look. I'm going to try to unmute you all without um, causing complete chaos, but let's see. Actually, a lot of you don't have audio on, so... Again, if you've got access to chat, let me know. Um, but that's it. The other, the, the easiest way to reach me, so let's say you have more questions on uh, the program. The other thing that I do before I um, start working with anybody in my billionaire brand builder is we have to have a one-hour conversation. And that one-hour conversation is, is not included in the, the money or anything. It's just what we talk about up front because I want to make sure that you're thinking about the branding and the marketing correctly that you're at a place where you even need that kind of help or you're open to that kind of help. So the email you get after this will also give you um, more of an overview about what it takes to work with me, 
the, the kind of people that get the best results out of this, um, and the way to schedule your, your free one-hour call so we can actually talk about the branding and marketing uh, and see where you are in the process. All right, but I thank everybody um, for being here. And again, if you have questions, drop me an email, Keith at mysacredfig.com for now. I don't have the email set up on the other one yet, but you'll be getting that soon. And I appreciate it and hope that you've gotten lots and lots of good information.